As I do more runs for the channel and the overall process and rule sets change, some runs require a revisit. For several months I've been streaming these older runs to get them in line with my current vision for a tier list, but some of these runs deserve their own proper video. And if you are curious about the streams, here's some shameless self promotion to tell you that you can catch those generally every Friday at 2pm central, and if you want to show some support or get a closer look at solo runs, check that out. Let's also do a redo from the first run, and if you want to show some support just type in sofa king so youtube might recommend this video to other like-minded individuals now overall the goal for this video is to provide the same experience as all my other videos but with a more streamlined feel due to the stream still being up if you want to see the full picture and also i made a mistake in my code so the experience to the next level segment of my overlay is a little bit wonky and it's not accurate at all but hopefully you can look past that Nino king was interesting enough to take a deeper dive into and the original video it took over the top spot in the tier list briefly so going into this one I knew it was good but how would it be in these new metrics the first huge change I made to the run was that I changed versions from red and blue to yellow and depending on who you ask you might think that yellow is much harder but that's just not the full picture yellow is specifically harder in about six or seven late game fights but if you have a Pokemon with a strong moveset and a lot of coverage in the late game you could handle it just fine now the key here and why you you'll see me testing out yellow more for some runs is the early game. This is the one area Nidal King had the toughest time in on red and blue and it being inconsistent as well didn't help but there are just countless Pokemon that feel the pain of terrible Brock splits holding them back. Yellow does several things to remedy this and just to make the overall early game easier. Now the first thing to look at is the additional trainers in Viridian Forest. The double Nidoran trainer and the extra bug catcher help you gain some much needed experience and since trainers give 50% additional experience, it means you'll spend a lot less time grinding wild Pokemon or backtracking for time consuming things like the optional rival fight. The next change is the Light Years Junior Trainer fight. The Diglett is the same and at level 12 Nidal King gets access to an exclusive yellow move and double kick and that's a game changer but more on that in a second. The main thing here is that Sandshrew doesn't have sand attack like it does in red and blue and that makes this one much more free to get past. As for Brock, obviously the super effective double kick does help a ton even if there wasn't any changes in the yellow version but the big thing here for the future runs is that the rock solid Pokemon trainer has two less levels on each of his Pokemon and the biggest thing to help out against Geodude is that it doesn't have defense curl. Overall, this is a very quick segment and we don't have to go too in depth anymore because double kick just trivializes it. Overall, those are the main reasons I'll be taking a hard look at playing yellow version with strong Pokemon with weaker Brock splits and while the rest of the video won't be as deep of a dive between version exclusives, I'll still bring up a few things here and there as we progress. Moving towards Mount Moon, there's nothing to see here. It's very easy but the one point of contention in the chat was the TM for Water Gun but it's really not needed, especially with double kick providing that rock coverage. Looking ahead, we can quickly go over rival number two. In weaker runs that aren't fully evolved Pokemon, the Spearow with Growl and the Sand Shrew immediately after it with a Sand Attack can make you roll your eyes, but I have good enough moves to minimize their chances to be annoying, and we can move on just like that. I will say my absolute favorite change in yellow and what makes it better to stream and do consistent speed runs is that the HM Pokemon are guaranteed. You get a Charmander that can use Dig and Cut here, here, and later in Vermilion you'll get a Squirtle for Surf and Strength and outside of the flyer that you can get pretty much at the start of the game this eliminates a lot of annoying RNG for a Paris like I usually like to do in red and blue and this is just my favorite change in the versions. Outside of that everything else is standard and smooth going into bills and now we can take a look at Misty. Lots of Pokemon weak to water like Nidal King have to train extra or just skip Misty entirely, but this is what makes Nidal King special. On the Staryu, a horn attack into an X defend means that I scoot past this one easily, but we know that this is never the issue. Bubble Beam crits are the thing of nightmares, but Thrash is absurdly strong at this level. We speed tie Starmie, we move first, do heavy damage, and then we get another X defend. On the next turn, we are still thrashing, and I crit, and that's the battle over. Now even with 
without the crit, I don't think a bubble beam would one shot us, so we would have likely won either way, but the important thing here is that Nidal King has one of the deepest TM learn sets in the game, and bubble beam will be useful looking ahead. Down at the SS and, body slam is the first order of business, so I picked that up along with the rare candy behind the gentleman, and let's just skim over the next couple of key battles real quick. Rival number three is the same as last time, and it's just easier because I got better moves, so let's just not dwell on this one, shall we? And as for Surge, I do get taken a little low, but I don't even heal. I don't care about this fight. There's not much to say. I'm a ground top. He's an electric top. Let's move on. Nidal King is way over prepared for Rock Tunnel, and from there, we can just keep it cruising into Celadon, where the game opens up a little bit. Now, first up is the Rocket Hideout, and a question I get asked often is, why don't I do the Pokey Dog glitch to skip over this segment? And the answer is simple. I kind of like it. Sure, it adds a little bit of time to my runs, but doing that glitch also requires me to make a very early Celadon Mart visit, and I like the strategic depth of being able to hold off on that if a run needs a little bit more vitamins, and visiting the Mart twice just wastes a lot of time. Anyway, as for the run, there's nothing special here, and Giovanni goes down easy. After that, we can also skip over Pokemon Tower. Rival number four is notoriously one of the easiest fights in the game, and with the yellow version having Jesse and James at the end rather than the mini gauntlet of Rocket Grunts, this is over quicker than the red and blue version. From there, I travel down to Fuchsia to pick up that flop path. I pick up the final HMs of the run along with some extra cash for vitamins. And after that, it's time for the Celadon buy. And a key difference here from red and blue is that I need Rock Slide, but we'll go into that more soon. I also grab Ice Beam here. I pick up four Calciums to bolster our special attack. And I pick up a single protein and that's our vitamins for the run. And then I replace Double Kick with Ice Beam. With Ice Beam in hand, I'm ready for Erica. And in the gym, I pick up five extra battles. This is to smooth out some later battles because these are some of the quickest and easiest experience you'll get for the rest of the game. Now as for Erica, this is another gym that is greatly nerfed from the red and blue version. I'd argue that Erica with a weak or average Pokemon in red and blue is one of the toughest battles, but here in yellow her Pokemon are devolved to middle stage evolutions and things are just easier and since I got Ice Beam and extra levels, there's nothing more to really say about this one. When that's done, we get into some of the big mid game differences between versions. Normally Koga would be the logical place to go, but his team is kind of like an annoying side grade in yellow, while rival number 5 is easier in yellow in my opinion, and I think that's to push players here after you complete the first 4 gems, but that's just some speculation. As a ground top, it's not a surprise that the 10th floor for Earthquake is the first order of business, so I head there to pick that up, I get the rare candy and the carbos, and from there it's straight to rival number 5. First up is Sand Slash, I outspeed, and I let a super effective Ice Beam rip, but it doesn't one shot. It hits back with a slash crit and it does some nice damage, but I'm able to get by with a second ice beam on the next turn. Next up is Cloyster. I have Thunderbolt and its special isn't the best, but I can't one shot it. And it has the choice of withdraw or clamp since I'm weak to water and luckily it goes for withdraw and I'm able to progress after the next bolt hits. Magneton comes in. It's weak to my massive 150 base power stabbed earthquake and that's all you really need to say about this one. Kadabra is next and the fact that the rival doesn't have an Alakazam yet just helps out a lot over red and blue. I am weak to Psychic as well, but by design, I outspeed and I'm able to one-shot it through its paper-thin defenses. The final Pokemon is Flareon, and once again, Earthquake is shining here, and it's another one-shot, and this one is over. As for the rest of Sylph, we don't need to see it, but instead, let's move on to Sabrina. Now, conventional wisdom would say that Koga is the gym to go to next, but his Pokemon also have Psychic, and I'm just going to take my my chances here on the more frail Pokemon here in Saffron. Abra's first, and it exists only to throw flash on you to lower your accuracy. Here it misses, and to no one's surprise, it gets obliterated. Kadabra's next, I don't outspeed, and Sabrina uses an X defend, which means that it can survive an earthquake. She then goes for Kinesis, and now my accuracy is lowered, but I don't miss the next turn, and now we get to see a familiar problem in a lot of runs. Alakazam is a very scary Pokemon, but here it just goes for a recover and an earthquake decimates it but it doesn't take it out. What happens next is a series of me missing and it using non-damaging moves until finally I connect 
and I get through another challenge of the run. At this point, I'm level 41, and the only place left to go is back down to Fuchsia, but I had a carefully orchestrated plan here. I replace Ice Beam with Rock Slide, and I use a few rare candies to get to level 45 for that nice damage rounding, and let's just talk about Koga. I won't deep dive into this battle too much, but to me, Koga is almost like a DPS check. If you've ever played an MMO and you are familiar with that term, you have to output enough damage to end this battle quick or you're just going to end up with toxic on you while getting chipped away with psychic damage. Luckily I'm a poison type and here I do meet the damage requirements and even though I don't one shot everything I just really want to emphasize that this one wasn't easy and it took a lot of planning for my test runs. It was a huge problem solve so even though it looks easier here it wasn't actually an easy fight. Now it's time for the most brisk of swims down to Cinnabar and there's nothing extra today so that means after some Tombstone brother. Let's skim over to Blaine. Now I'm a ground type. I have access to Earthquake. I have access to Rock Slide if I need it. And if you want to know how seriously I'm taking this battle, I don't heal. So let's just move on. Finally up is Giovanni. And this is the fight of Pokemon Yellow that is exponentially harder over its pushover red and blue counterpart. To prepare for this rough fight, I do use three more rare candies to get up to level 50 for damage rounding. And I learned Blizzard. So let's just talk about this one. First up is Dugtrio and getting past 133 speed to move is key here. Dugtrio is a very frail Pokemon and one Blizzard is all it takes to get past. Next up is Persian and 135 speed is the break point so you can see that my 136 speed here is no accident. One Earthquake doesn't quite do it and the classy cat uses double team and after missing I do take it out shortly after but I do take a Screech first. As for the two Nidos they can be a threat but Earthquake hits hard and it's enough super effective damage to get them both down with one shots and we are at zero resets and I'm just gonna play a part from the live stream that's just a perfect prediction by past Matt and the only way that we can lose right now is if Blizzard misses And my friends, that is how the first reset of the run occurs, by not hitting a 90% accurate move, but I expect nothing less from Gen 1. As for rival number 6, there's no need to deep dive or do any intro music here. With Blizzard, Thunderbolt, and Earthquake, I have super effective damage against his whole team, and with the candies I just used to get past Giovanni and Koga, I pack enough punch to get past this one without taking a single point of damage. Now this fight is exactly what I man at the start when I said trading an easier Brock split is worth it if you have a great move pool for the late game and heading into the Elite Four we'll see that come into play even more. The move sets are much improved here in yellow but I do think that Nidal King is equipped to handle those challenges. Before I head in I use rare candies to get up to level 57 and now we get to see how we handle another weakness that we haven't seen yet. Now let's take a look at Lorelai the Ice Elite Four member. Dugong is up first, and it's known for using Rest on turn 2, but since Rest is a psychic move, it can pick it immediately, and that's what happens here, and a few Thunderbolts gets us past. Cloyster is second, and we can one-shot the rival's Cloyster previously, but here, we can't. But I do get it low enough for a potion to trigger, and that seals its fate. Now Slowbro is third, I can't one-shot it, and it lets a psychic loose that does heavy damage and drops my special before it finally goes down. Jinx is next, and with lower defense one earthquake is all I need to get past this one. Lapras is last but the unfortunate special drop from earlier just seals my fate. Thunderbolt does pretty pathetic damage but what's worse is that Blizzard now does extra damage and that's the second reset of the run. The second attempt goes even better at the start but Thunderbolt does not put Lapras low enough and a hydro pump forces my third reset. Now finally on the third attempt I get a crit and that puts Lapras low enough to trigger a super potion and then I I'm able to take the battle after only two resets. Now as for Bruno, we don't even need to go into it. We know how Bruno battles usually go, and let's just let's take a look at the end of this. As for Agatha, this one is perhaps easier than Bruno. It might be the easiest fight in the game. I outspeed, I have super effective damage for her whole team, and this one is just a series of one shots and something that we can just move on from quickly. As for Lance, there's some things that we won't see in this run, but his team is equipped to not be at 
absolutely useless against poison tops, but when you are this fast and you have Thunderbolt for Gyarados and Blizzard for the Dragons, this one doesn't really change too much in this version. Just like with Agatha, I don't even bother to heal, and I easily weave through this one and we get past everything really easy. Finally, the champion is all that's left, and let's see if we can cap off this dominant Elite Four run after some hiccups with Lorelai. Sandslash is first, and Blizzard is enough to take it out before any threat of an earthquake can hit us. Alakazam is second, and it's very scary, but through careful planning, guys, I outspeed, and we can avoid any potential psychics here. Next up is Executor. It's annoying, and Blizzard cannot one-hit it, but unfortunately, it misses the hypnosis, and I can get the two-hit on it to continue cruising along in the battle. Magneton can't withstand a massive earthquake, and another one is down. Cloyster is next, and I can't get this one down in one hit. And finally, we get to see Needle King bleed. And Aurora Beam does nice damage, but it also drops my attack before I take it out, and we move on to the end of the fight. Finally up is Flareon, and you might wonder if that attack drop matters. It doesn't. Earthquake slaps this puppy down, and that's the run over. And that's it, Niddle King has done it. This run was fantastic and an overall massive improvement over the run I did about a year ago. The only hiccups was a couple of resets on Lorelai and some bad luck at Giovanni, but other than that, this run was really consistent, but let's just take a look at the stats. Niddle King finishes with a level of 61, three resets, and has an in-game time of two hours and 32 minutes. I'm gonna bring up my updated tier list and some of you familiar with the channel might noticed that I reshuffled things a little bit. Now remember that this might not include some of my recent streams just yet because my stream timeline and my video timeline are not always in sync. Now anyway, if you zoom in here, you'll see that the A plus tier now holds Gengar and Haunter by themselves after their really dominant runs and the compromise to the question of if they belong in the S tier was just to pretty much give them their own tier right down from YouTube. Down below that, I have Nidal King at the top spot of the A tier and the other grayed out runs are things that I still need to redo. And if I already have before this video comes out, just get over it. It's worth noting that Machamp actually had a slightly better time of two hours and 29 minutes, but it just had more resets and it really struggled on more fights. And when you take all that into account, Middle King was just more consistent and it felt better. And that's about all I have for you guys. If you made it this far, you're a real one and I appreciate you. And consider subscribing if you want more solo run content. Content. Leave a like, share the video with a friend, and if you want to do any more, consider becoming a channel member. And speaking of which, special thanks to my existing members. Shout out to JWJ, Mutus Dozen, Deez Masters, TR2G Hipster, Cheesy Speakeasy, Josh Ferment, and Kendall C. And I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye!